Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest today is Christian Parenti. He is an investigative journalist, an academic, and an author. Welcome, Christian. Thank you so much for coming on. Hello. There you go. All right. I got unstable internet connection is what it said here. So hopefully that that happens, keeps happening. I'll have to move. Okay. All right. So Christian, uh, you wrote an article recently. I wanted to get into this called uh, how the lockdowns prime the current financial crisis. And it goes on to say the lockdowns and the stimulus required to keep the economy alive, help drive inflation. Then the Fed jacked up interest rates and all hell broke loose. So I want to get into uh, this topic here. Um, I live in Massachusetts. My state was locked down. Uh, so I, I did see a lot of businesses close uh, during the lockdowns and some of them closed uh, permanently. Governor Baker at the time still said that he felt like that was the correct decision. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that because those businesses were not able to come back uh, after they allowed businesses to reopen. So I want to get your take on this when you talk about how these lockdowns actually drove the inflation. Can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I mean, something we should probably deal with is the legitimacy or the necessity of the lockdowns. But the way what I argued in that article for the gray zone was that, I mean, I just showed, you know, the facts, which are that the amount of debt that the government takes on during the lockdowns was unprecedented. It was enormous. In the Second quarter of 2020, the federal government took on $3 trillion in debt. And then during the rest of the pandemic, so that's the opening of the pandemic, then it takes on almost another trillion dollars. So what happens with the, the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, which is one way of sort of monitoring the, determining the level of, you know, support that the government is giving the economy, the Federal Reserve Reserve prior to the crisis of 2008 had less than a trillion dollars on its balance sheet. With the crisis of 2008, the collapse of the international banking system, the de facto nationalization of the American banking system, and then quantitative easing, which involved the Federal Reserve, which just electronically creates money. It's you know, government controlled, but it's an independent central bank, and it has essentially an electronic checkbook. And it started going into the markets and buying up corporate debt, buying up corporate assets. This is a way of injecting money into corporations that would otherwise be failing. In some extreme cases, you have what are called zombie corporations like, like J.C. Penney's. This is a company that probably shouldn't even exist anymore, but it's sort of like a Ponzi scheme. They, they keep issuing debt to pay off their old debt. And during quantitative easing, the Federal Reserve is buying up enormous amounts of this corporate debt. So its balance sheet goes up to, um, well, eventually goes up to about four and a half percent. By 2014, it has reached, sorry, not four and a half percent, but four and a half trillion. It has reached, uh, yeah, at, at 2014, four and a half trillion dollars from less than a trillion. And a lot of this is the Federal Reserve printing this money and then going in to the markets and buying corporate bonds, buying assets of all sorts to prop up the value of companies, right? At the same time, the government is issuing debt. And the way the government, the federal government issues debt is that the Treasury Department sells bonds. It basically says, you know, who will lend us money? Here's a, here's a, here's a legal contract that says, if you give me $100 today in two years, if it's a two-year Treasury or 10 years, you know, whatever, we'll give you uh, you know, a hundred and five dollars back, right? Like five dollars, you know, five percent interest a year, whatever. Um, and the Federal Reserve will buy is one of the customers that will buy those government bonds. So that's when people talk about how like the government printing money. I mean, that's that, what, what the government does. The Treasury Department is it issues debt, and then the central bank buys a lot of it. So what happened during the pandemic was precisely that: Treasury issues a lot of debt and and the Federal Reserve buys the vast majority of it. 
So anyway, as part of the bailout from 2008, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet goes up to four and a half trillion, but it's coming down, starting at plateaus in 2014, and it begins to come down in 2018, and it goes down to I think it's 3.7 trillion from five point from 4.5 trillion at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's on its way down. The Federal Reserve is unwinding all of this debt that it has taken on. It's letting the private sector kind of stand on its own two feet again. Then what happens with the lockdowns is that the Federal Reserve's balance sheet goes straight up. I mean, the line, the proverbial line, the actual line on the graph goes straight up during the second quarter of 2020 and $3 trillion are added. So it almost doubles its balance sheet. And then for the rest of the pandemic, as I said, another trillion is added and it tops out at almost $9 billion. It's now coming down from that. So all of that money is pushed into the economy. All that purchasing power is pushed into the economy because of the lockdowns. And the lockdowns, I think, were a total overreaction. And, you know, we knew they were going to be destructive on many levels. But what happened with the lockdowns is that you get inflation from this. Because if you tell people, say, hey, don't go to work, you know, a lot of people don't go to work, but you're going to starve, right, if you don't go to work and don't have a wage. So here's some money, right? Well, what you get is a, just a classic disequilibrium between supply and demand. You get a, you know, a boost to demand and a contraction of supply because supply chains are disrupted by people being locked down. Just to take one very important example, there is at the height of the pandemic, a shortage of 80,000 truck drivers because a lot of commercial drivers licensed schools in various states closed down for a year, in some cases, two years. Uh, there's mass retirement of older workers. Truck truck driving is is really really tough business, especially long haul trucking. It's you know hard to get decent food. You don't get any exercise. You're away from your family. It's a really really difficult job. So there's a lot of people are leaving trucking, right? Death is in the air. There's constant stories of people dying. People, truck drivers are thinking, well, 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 I don't want to do this with my last year, my potentially my last year of life. I'm out of here, right? And then there's no one else coming in to take their place because the CDL schools, commercial driver's license schools, you, you have to be in person to do that. You can't learn to drive a semi truck online, right? So 80,000 truck drivers short, that alone creates massive uh, blockages in the supply chain. There's also, you know, factories are shut down, meat processing plants are shut down, ports are shut down, all this. So supply constricts as demand is actually quite healthy. And this is a comment on how poor working class Americans are, that the increase stimulus, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm anti-stimulus. I'm totally in favor of government stimulus. and I'm totally in favor of the redistribution of wealth and of public spending going to working people. But it is going to lead to inflation if at the same time you are shutting down the economy due to overreacting to a disease. So you actually saw the personal savings rate in the U.S. go up by 8% because people are so poor that having a longer duration of unemployment and then an you know, extra $600 on unemployment plus these two sort of one-off stimulus checks, it actually made a huge difference to people. So writ large across the economy, there's actually quite a, a you know a, a boom in consumption. Then you throw in the pay tax Pay paycheck protection program, the Providers Relief Fund, $178 billion to keep the hospitals going. Businesses have lots of money. All this money is going into banks. And long story short, with the constriction of supply and the increased purchasing power, you get inflation. And by the spring of 2022, inflation is headed towards 9%. At first, the Federal Reserve is saying, and the Treasury Department and all the government's economic key spokespeople are saying <clears throat> inflation is transitory. Don't don't freak out. And then they finally realize, wait a minute, uh, we have to do something. So then beginning in the spring of 2022, the Federal Reserve begins jacking up interest rates at the steepest pace ever in American history. It's not the, the, the largest overall increase in interest rates, but it's the steepest, quickest increase. And so this creates a kind of whiplash in reaction to suppressing this inflation. They're now desperately trying to 
cut down on inflation by, by you know, crushing economic growth by making it more expensive to borrow money, right? If you make it more expensive to borrow money, then businesses are less likely to expand, less likely to hire, less likely to increase wages and bonuses, and therefore consumption will contract, and therefore there'll be less demand and relatively more supply and prices will come down, right? So they do this panic thing and banks, this now we get to Silicon Valley Bank. Many banks were in the same position as Silicon Valley Bank. And so what happened at Silicon Valley Bank was that during this wave of stimulus money in the pandemic, Silicon Valley Bank's deposits went way up because a lot of companies partly, again, due to the lockdowns, didn't really have investment outlets, yeah. you know? So they just put their money in the bank. Similarly, the bank doesn't really have many loans to make. I forget the specific numbers, but I, I'm pretty sure that Silicon Valley Bank's deposits doubled or more than doubled, and their rate of lending went up only 7%, right? So they just got tons of cash, and they can't give it all out. So they got a lot, a lot of cash. Yeah. With... The jacking up of interest rates in the spring of 2022, well, suddenly now it's expensive to borrow money, right? So companies are less likely to go borrowing money. And if they got a whole bunch of money in the bank, which is earning basically nothing, because that's what you know it was paying. I mean, the, these banks load up, oh, I should say, when Silicon Valley has all of these deposits pour in and it's not able to make loans to the private sector, you know, well, what do they do with this money? They buy basically zero interest government debt, treasury bonds that were paying 0.5%, right? So the bank is loaded up with all of this cheap government debt. As their deposits are leached out of the accounts in reaction to the rising interest rates, which are about trying to fight inflation, individuals and companies are saying, hey, let's not borrow any money. Let's use some of our savings, right? So the deposits go out for that reason. Companies and individuals are also saying, wait a minute, inflation is you know approaching 9% and we've got lots of money sitting in the bank earning nothing. We should at least buy some of this new government debt because as the Federal Reserve's rates approach 5%, so too do treasury bonds now start being offered at close to 5%. So if you're in a you know, in a bank which is holding a bunch of 0% interest treasury bonds and you're earning nothing in your deposit, why not just get the money out and go buy 5% or 4% treasury bonds? You know, you'll, you're still probably going to be losing money if inflation stays at 9%, but you're going to be losing a lot less. So money is being used and money surplus capital is being redeployed. So then suddenly Silicon Valley Bank realizes, whoa, Far from having a cash surplus, we don't have enough cash on hand to cover our day-to-day -day needs. And they have to sell off some of the low interest, basically 0% interest government debt that they, that they had piled up on during the pandemic. And when they sell that debt, if they, if they did not sell that debt and if they held it for whatever the duration, two years, 10 years, 30 years, depending on the bond, they would get the face value of that debt. Right, of that bond. But if you sell it before its maturity date on secondary markets, you get below the face value. So they realize, well, we have to sell bonds just to get cash to keep operating. And they, they sell and they lose $2 billion, just shy of $2 billion in the sale. They announce that and then stockholders panic. And then their stock crashes by 60%. And then all of these depositors who are quite reckless and really quite arrogant startup <laughs> firms and tech founders, um, some of them fabulously wealthy, like Peter Thiel. It yep. turned out that $50 billion uninsured in one of these bank accounts. So all these rich people in Silicon Valley have more than the federally insured $250,000 in these accounts. And so they're like, wait a minute, if this bank goes under and banks go under, um, and it's not a problem you know, for the average person, who doesn't have more than $250,000 in one bank account, you know, upper middle class, you know, moderately wealthy people who maybe have more than that, that they can put in a bank, you generally are, are, aren't going to like put it all in one bank account. They'll at least have two bank accounts. Right. But these characters are having like 10, 20, 
50 million dollars in bank accounts that are only insured up to 250,000. So then they all panic and then the the leaching away, the draining out of the deposits which was causing the problem for the bank to begin with accelerates and you get a classic bank run of people in their, you know, tech bro vests on their phones lined up panicked in front of the bank trying to get their money out. And so that that's how Silicon Valley Bank went under and the role of the pandemic or specifically the lockdown is central in that story because the whole trajectory was for the the macroeconomic trajectory for the economy was that 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 build up of federal reserve of debt on the federal reserve's balance sheet was coming down it was headed it had plateaued and it was now coming down right and it's the lockdowns that caused that to go in the opposite direction and double right uh, and then you get this whipsaw of like all of because as as the the balance sheet doubles, as the government is printing and borrowing money, right? That means interest rates go really, really low. That helps create inflation. To fight inflation, interest rates go up. In the face of rising interest rates, all these institutions want to dump the old cheap debt, which they do. And the more they dump, the lower the 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 purchasing price of this on secondary markets, the lower the price, the more they have to dump. Um, so it's, you know, it's the, the sort of one, two punch of it is that the lockdowns plus stimulus create inflation The inf and, 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 and going with inflation is all this cheap debt. In response to inflation, interest rates go up. As interest rates go up, there's new, more valuable debt and there's a panic to get rid of the old debt. Christian, sense? what would you, it, it does, um, I, I want to play uh, devil's advocate just a little bit. What would you say to those like Professor Richard Wolf, who says that it's because of, of price gouging? What would you say to people who that are using? Is, yeah, that inflation is, well, that's part of what sustains it, but it's the lockdown that, that kicks it off. There's also uh, the role of energy price spikes because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and mm -hmm. there was uncertainty as to how, what would happen with energy markets. So it's not that that's the only thing, but that's definitely the, the lockdowns are what triggers it. It doesn't begin with price gouging. It, it begins with this enormous $3 trillion stimulus amidst this supply chain wrecking lockdowns. How do you think countries like uh, New Zealand, for example, they actually shut down for, I believe it was about a month, told everyone to stay at home, but they still paid them. They paid everybody there. How do you think they were able to handle this differently than the United States? Like they were still able to pay everyone there. Uh, they got their weekly checks just like they would if they were still going to work and they shut down the entire country. Why do you feel they weren't affected the well, same way I, that I, we were I, here? I haven't. Yeah, I haven't looked into the New Zealand situation and they may or may not in the long run be affected, right? There is $620 billion of unrealized losses on bank balance sheets right now. So to put that in perspective, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which was the de facto nationalization of the banking system, which in which the federal government bought up, you know, about, I guess, 20% of, of the, the shares of a... Of, of most of the big banks and held them and kept banks alive as a result of that and held them until the economy recovered and then sold all that. And the federal government actually made 20 billion on that. Um, but so just to put it in, in perspective, you know, that was a $700 billion program. That was a massive bailout. And there's $620 billion that we know of, of unrealized losses in the banking system. And we have, you know, the uh, Jerome Powell and others have staunched the, the crisis by bailing out depositors and by making it clear that they're, you know, prepared to print as much money as necessary to shore up the banking system. And you've got, you know, Credit Suisse was bailed out by being sold to UBS, but it was the Swiss government telling UBS, and that was an 80, 000, an $80 billion bank that sold for $3.2 billion. And the Swiss government still had to guarantee that if there are any more losses, we'll pay for it, right? So there's, I mean, in the background of this is 
again, the specter of de facto nationalization of the banking system. So the whole international credit system is tied together and the U.S. is central to the globe's credit system. And this very well could uh, go south again. Well, what about uh, modern monetary theory? So the MMT specialists, they've come on here a couple of times and they've explained that the government can just simply print new money into existence as it already does. And they've also argued that the government could mint a coin to wipe all of this out. Uh, why do you feel that that theory, MMT, is not being pushed more in reference to what the government can do instead of coming in and bailing out the banks? Well, you know, the MMTers are technically right, but I think they're politically naive. I mean, they also say that 40% inflation would be politically feasible. And I mean, I don't think that's the case. And what's often assumed is just that, well, you know, in, you know, nominal inflation doesn't matter, right? As long as wages keep up with prices. It's like, but in reality, you need really strong working class movements for that to happen. And what we've seen is that wages have not kept up with prices. On average, wages have increased by 5% as, as prices topped out at 9%. And, but yet, you know, it was more like 8%. So a lot of people have seen actual real losses to their purchasing power, even as they've gotten wages, wage increases, those wages increases haven't kept up with inflation. So I think it is cavalier and ahistorical to, uh, to just like wave away the politics of inflation. But, oh, that's just for creditors. It doesn't matter. You know, uh, only creditors care about inflation. If you're not a bank, who cares? It's like, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think that's what history shows. I think that people get very freaked out by that. And there can be all sorts of political repercussions that are negative. Um, and to, just to assume, oh, well, wages will go up. Like, well, well, how are wages going to go up? We have, you know, what is it? You know, less than 10% union density in this country, something like, you know, around eight or 7% in the private sector. I mean, the working class is, is weak in this country um, in terms of its capacity, historically speaking, to struggle for wage increases. So... Another issue I noticed, too, during the lockdowns was the government implemented the PPE loans that was supposed to help out the small businesses. But then after talking to business owners, some of the business owners said they didn't even receive that money. I think the federal government may have made a mistake here, assuming that the governors of these states were just going to automatically do the right thing and distribute that money uh, quickly as possible. So for some of the small businesses, by the time they got the loan money, it was already too late. They already had to shut down because they had been closed and out of business for so long. What do you think could have been done differently there? Like, do you think it was the right idea for the federal government to assume that the governors of those states were going to handle that properly? Oh, I think you froze. Um, you're kind of breaking up there. Uh oh. He'll be back. I think his internet's a little unstable. All right. There you go. There we go. I lost it for a second. Um, um, the, the PPE. PPE yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, well, some of that, you know, some, some, a lot, I mean, a lot, a lot of, a lot of businesses did get it. Um, mm -hmm. And was there corruption? Yeah, there's been massive corruption. There's whole, you know, special units in the FBI to look into this stuff now. Um, but I mean, I think the deeper question is, was the lockdown necessary? Were the lockdowns necessary? Now, if, if you say, if, if you just say, okay, lockdowns were necessary, in that case, it's like, then you had to do this kind of stuff. You know, this is what had to be done. Like, as I said earlier, I'm not against stimulus and uh, public spending at all um, or, or against government debt. But the lockdowns weren't necessary and the lockdowns were incredibly destructive. And people knew that going into it and they warned about it and people were censored, okay? And this is something that the left is not capable of dealing with because it sided with this overreaction. It went all in for this insanity. And many leftists don't even know how ill-informed they are because it is only now coming out how intense the censorship was 
of voices on social media who dissented from the official line. So we did not have an open, fully informed conversation about what the consequences of these lockdowns would be for children, for economic development in the global south, for small businesses. We could go on and on and on. And those who tried to bring it up were censored. Their stories could not be circulated, et cetera, right? Why? I'm sure there are many of your listeners who are stuck in March 2020, right? And that they think, I, I, mean, I went outside today, and I saw a couple of people in masks, right? There are people who are like still totally, in my opinion, out of their minds with fear about this yep. disease. Now, I was totally freaked out at first as well. And because I was so scared, I read diligently. And the first randomly controlled study of the real infection fatality rate came out of Iceland. And it found that, okay, this is COVID is a serious disease, but it's not what Niall Ferguson at Imperial College London, the infamous modeler who got mad cow completely wrong and is, you know, a professional doomsayer. His model said that it was going to be, I think it was three to three and a half percent infection fatality rate, right? The real infection fatality rate at the peak with the original Wuhan strain, which was the most deadly, was 0.3%, something like that. John Ioannidis of Stanford, who was who is a leading epidemiologist, not a fringe character, and who was viciously censored, mocked, dismissed, has done and was doing studies all along. He's done more recent studies that that puts the infection fatality rate basically in neck neck and neck with the flu, right? So if we had been able to have these conversations, we realized early on, and we did realize early on, because when I read that Iceland study, I was like, oh, wow, Whew, we dodged a bullet. Now the New York Times is going to have a big think piece about this, and we're going to have a whole conversation. This is going to like start you know, unwinding, and I can tell my wife, who was worried that these lockdowns are going to go on and on, I can say, see, dear, you know, I don't know why you were doubting Joe Biden and, you know, uh, <laughs> rather Anthony Fauci, you know. Um, but then that didn't happen. It's because the whole thing got politicized, right, from both sides. You had in March 2020, you've got in early March 2020, I think it's March 9th or March 11th. I forget exactly the date. Bill de Blasio, mayor of New York, then is telling people, look, if you get this disease and you're under age 50, it's nothing to worry about. It's the flu. We're not going to close schools. Two weeks later, he closes the schools. What happens in mid-late March is, is politicization. Trump is beginning to help politicize this. There's a, a kind of grassroots movement of small business people pushing back against the lockdowns. There's a bunch of uh, right-wing kind of dark money going into that from the DeVos family, kind of the, the donors trust scene is supporting these movements. You got protests at 35 state capitals and some really shocking images of armed men, you know, threatening governors and stuff like that. And amidst all that, in late March, Trump says, I want the economy to be open by Easter. And at that point, it was like, gloves come off, you know, it was on. He was basically like, okay, he threw down the gauntlet and he said, Democrats, you guys want to own the lockdowns? Fine, we'll own the reopening. And he gambled that the virus was going to burn out in the summer. And obviously it didn't. It kept coming back. And, and, it, and, and that miscalculation on his part was part of why he lost the election, I think. And I think the Democrats and liberals and progressives in general were like, this time we finally got him. It wasn't, it didn't work with Hollywood access. It didn't work with every other thing. It's like this time, this time he's really messed up. This time we're going to get him. And they did. And so it was like on the left, there was no room for thinking about this at all. So I think that's what happened. And so we didn't, there was no discussion about, wait a minute, is this really necessary? What are we doing? And, you know, I mean, the learning loss for children is horrible. You weren't even allowed to point out the fact that hospitals were being, that many hospitals were empty. I remember my own disbelief in late March, early April, a good friend of mine was at that time working for SEIU in Michigan. And I called him up and was like, how are things going? And he was like, well, in Detroit, we can't even get, PPE for our members. But in Western and Northern Michigan, we have numerous hospitals that are literally entirely empty except for their employees at night. There's like no one in there, right? And that alone has helped 
lead to a post-pandemic increase in all-cause mortality. There's a surge in cancer deaths. You know, people, people were warning of that immediately. The Financial Times, before that moment of total politicization, early on had an article it was you know, a write-up of some British study which said, you know, we're going to have 18,000 extra deaths of cancer if these lockdowns go on for six months or whatever it was, right? And it's like people were talking about it. But then once that politicization happened, it was like, shut up, do not question. And I remember my own shock that what my friend told me, but I, you know, he's one of my best friends. I know, know he's not lying. And I would tell people this and, and you know, some, of, some close friends of mine just like rejected it, did, didn't want to deal with it, you know? Um, so a kind of mass psychosis set in rooted in what, I don't know, fear, rational fear, misplaced rational fear about how violent and unequal and out of control global capitalism is. I think that's what a lot of it is. And it affected upon this, you know? Um, yeah. so, but, so what I'm saying, long story short is the lockdowns were a mistake and we didn't get to have a public conversation about that. And one of the effects along with surging cancer, along with incredible damage to, to student uh, learning is we've got this bubble and, and crash. Now it has been, you know, the crisis has been staunched for the moment, but um, you know, we're, we're now, this is a, an established feature of neoliberalism that's not gonna go away, which is this kind of de facto bailout Wall Street socialism that the whole thing depends on, right? Neoliberal, unregulated free market capitalism has a bailout problem, and um, and the recklessness of the lockdowns plus stimulus brought that into focus again. Even in reference to the education piece, uh, I was still working in higher ed at the time. There was this assumption, at least by state lawmakers, that every student had their own laptop at home and had a quiet remote space that they could go to for eight hours, Monday through Friday. And that was not the reality. So student learning actually suffered, at least here in, in Massachusetts, during that time, because those lawmakers just had those unrealistic expectations. And so for those students that have to share a room with a brother or a sister, uh, don't have their own laptop, they greatly struggled like during that time. But when I would tell people this, I felt like the left was very split over this issue, Christian. And I felt like it, it divided like friendships and spaces. And when I would explain this to people as someone who was an educator, they were just like, well, it's, it's just foolish not to shut down. And I'm like, but why? Yeah. But yeah. why? Yeah. My mother-in-law is a school teacher in Eastern Kentucky. And uh, yeah, I mean, same thing happened there, you know, and it was like, she's like, this is crazy. This, I mean, you know, numerous of her kids didn't have internet connection. They don't have computers at home. And, and some of them like that, their parents don't even have smartphones. Right. Yeah. And their parents for my, you know, some of them were, were essential workers and, and it was a total disaster. Yeah. I think in Baltimore, I'm forgetting the numbers, but it was like something like 20,000 kids just disappeared, just dropped yes. out of school, just gone. Right. And that, that I'm sure is replicated all over the country. Yeah. And you weren't allowed to talk about it. Um, I, you know, and people, yeah, you were not allowed to do anything like a, a cost benefit analysis. Right. And that, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be calling people names when I say that there was a kind of hysteria, but I mean, there, what I mean is there was a kind of irrational fear took over. It's like, you're not allowed to do a cost benefit analysis, but we're encouraged to do that all the time around everything. Why can't we do it on this? Why can't we say, is it really worth it to do it to these kids who the science increasingly shows aren't really that uh, prone to being harmed by this, right? We now know there's like a, a thousand percent difference. Like if you're over 65, this is a really different disease. There are very serious risks, right? I mean, if you're like, if you're under 20, it's like very, very few kids died of, of this, of COVID and very few who didn't have like multiple comorbidities, many of whom were probably were going to die otherwise. I mean, I wrote a, a very long article for the gray zone in um, 2021 and, um, or no, I guess it was March 20, it was a year ago, March, 2022. And in there, I, 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 you know, took on the question of the death count and it's something you're not supposed to do, but it's like, look, the government compelled an overcounting and overclassification of COVID deaths. They did this unintentionally. It's not some big conspiracy. They did it by ordering lockdowns and ordering 
hospitals to clear the decks, right? Well, that created instantly that created a financial crisis. So then the government also did the right thing and created the Providers Relief Fund, which which had $178 billion in it, which to put it in perspective, that's like a quarter of the military budget for, for that year. Um, mm -hmm. And that was made available to cover the costs of COVID cases. At first, a case qualified as COVID only if you had an in vitro test. But in, it's all in the article footnoted, I forget whether it's in, in April or in March, the rules are changed so that a case can be qualified as COVID based on the diagnosis of a doctor. And so they can just say, well, these symptoms, to my mind, add up to a COVID case, right? And there was definitely pressure on medical staff. I've heard from people who worked in hospitals that like, yes, we were, you know, we were expected to basically call things COVID. And everyone kind of understood why. What are you going to do? We're going to like be some sort of like ridiculous boy scout and be like, I don't think this is really COVID. It's like, why? Because you want to lose your job. You want to see all your friends that you've worked with. You want, you want this whole place to go under? Like, mm -hmm. because you're going to be like really honest about like, now, this person had COVID, but that's not why they died. It's like, just shut up and call it a COVID death, you know? Um, I mean, who wouldn't? I would. If I was a hospital administrator and it was like, okay, my choices are I can be like some, you know, stick up the butt Boy Scout, or I can be like, you know, lean into it. I mean, and uh, uh, the head of uh, uh, Al Cesar's head of uh, Health and Human Services, I mean, he said, he said, our goal is to get the money from the Providers Relief Fund out the door as quickly as possible, right? They did not want hospitals to collapse. We have had a massive wave of closures, uh, a trimming of our healthcare infrastructure in this country. And, you know, it's dangerous to go any further. And so it was like, it's good that they say the hospitals. So I'm not saying, I'm not pathologizing the people who, who played along with that. That's what they had to do. And I'm not saying it was a conspiracy, but it's just like, it, it happened kind of organically. If you overreact and then you got to compensate, then you get, oh, you get an incentive structure to overcount COVID. So then the press runs with it. And then every, you know, freaked out leftist can, can flip out on anyone who questions this and point to the pile of bodies, you know. And again, I'm not saying COVID wasn't real. It's real. But, but uh, I think there was a lot of overcounting. Well, I can't speak for, for other areas, but I know like in Boston, the hospitals were pretty full. Um, I, I do have friends that are nurses that work at places like Brigham and Women's. Um, so they actually did not have enough staff. They had nurses that were quitting during that time. There were doctors that were quitting uh, as well, including even dentists where people were, were choosing early retirement because mm -hmm. they just did not want to deal with this. So I think part of the problem, at least here in Boston, was just having that manpower. There just weren't enough people to actually, you know, focus on the patients, whether it was whether it was a COVID issue or whether it was any other diagnosis. They didn't have enough people staffed because people were saying, I'm taking early retirement or I'm quitting. And so that was another issue that we had to deal with here as well. But do you think that the left is continuing to become divided over different issues. Like at one point, there was a divide over force the vote for Medicare for all. Then it was the divide over the, the jab mandates and, and the pandemic. And now there's there seems to be a divide as well over the release of these Twitter files. And, and Matt Taibbi, uh, he's been on this show. We've talked extensively about this. He's had numerous interviews. But there seems to be a segment of the left that is now smearing Matt Taibbi, yeah. calling him right wing mm -hmm. because of the information that was reported. And there's also a segment of the left that is in some way, shape or form defending the FBI and, and, and the CIA for, for some crazy reason. Like, that's not what the left was supposed to be about. Yeah. It just seems like we're becoming more and more divided. And I don't know. I don't know what's causing this. But from my perspective, the left was never supposed to be in support of those types of government agencies. I mean, look at who those agencies killed. It came out what recently that Malcolm X's family has filed a lawsuit against the FBI. So it was really weird. It's, it just seems like it's dangerous in a sense because now it gives people the impression that the right is 
against the FBI. Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying abolish the FBI, right? So I feel like this is, is dangerous in a sense, but why do you feel like this is happening? Well, I think it was COVID. I think COVID broke people's brains. And what I argued in that year old 8,000 word piece on up at the gray zone uh, is that it was Trump derangement syndrome, that you know, it was like this, that, that, you know, basically the, the system, the mainstream of the Republican party, the mainstream of the democratic party, the vast majority of the media didn't like Trump and don't like Trump. And I wrote a, another piece for the gray zone recently getting at what I think the heart of the matter is. And it's like, you know, a lot of people don't like him because he's crass. My mother, who I love very dearly, but I mean, she, you know, I, how, how to put this, but I mean, she made comments earlier on which like she wouldn't have minded if she'd seen him assassinated. And, her, and his basic sin in her eyes was that he was basically disgusting and crass and a pig, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, so that that's just kind of humorous. That's where, but it's, it's an indication where a lot of people are out there like, this guy's so disgusting, right? Um, but I think that the real thing at the heart of it was that this guy was uh, totally out of control in terms of U.S. empire. If you look at his foreign policy, he vandalized the U.S. empire. Because you, you think at first, like, what, how could the system broadly defined, how could the ruling class, how could the rich and the, the upper echelons, the professional managerial class who serve the interests of the rich and get paid well for doing it. Well, why would they have a beef with this guy? He gave them massive tax cuts. He gave industry, you know, tons of deregulation. What, what's the problem? Well, look at his foreign policy. The dude was out of control. He was not some sort of progressive anti-imperialist. He had this crass transactional sensibility. But it was destructive. He, he ordered a third of the troops in Germany removed. Germany is this, you know, there's 40 military bases that house American forces in Germany. This is a center for a whole region-wide thing. AFRICOM is actually headquartered in Germany. 104 countries are, you know, U.S., potential U.S. military operations in 104 countries depend on this fulcrum in Germany. Trump wanted a third of those troops removed. His, his national security staff did their best to undermine that and redeploy the troops and, and keep him off balance. He, he trashed the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He withdrew a quarter of the troops from South Korea. He drew down uh, like a third of the troops from Iraq. He, he negotiated the end to the war in Afghanistan. Okay, it took place, the withdrawal took place under Biden, but, you know, that was all predicate. It would have been much bloodier and much more insane had there not been this agreement that uh, had been hammered out by, by the Trump's administration negotiators. He withdrew basically all the forces from Somalia. He withdrew lots of forces from Syria and then redeployed them to an area where there's oil. There's not that much oil in Syria. Yeah, they export none. They produce like 300,000 barrels a day as all for internal consumption. You know, he wanted to close all the embassies in Africa because he's a racist, not because he's an anti-imperialist. Um, <clears throat> the point is, you know, the guy was reckless. Six months into his administration, the Joint Chiefs of Staff had a meeting with him. They invited him to the Pentagon. He came to a famous meeting room called The Tank. And they had this big presentation for him of, of trying to explain how the American empire, the system of informal empire established at the end of World War II, how it works, the treaties, the alliances with different governments, the training programs, the types of weaponry involved, the types of surveillance, you know, he's explaining all this stuff and it's all over his head. And he says to them, you guys are dopes and babies and losers who don't know how to win wars anymore. He said, it, we're getting ripped off. In the Middle East, we've spent $7 trillion. Where's the fucking oil? That's a direct quote. Right. And can you imagine the Joint Chiefs of Staff like, wow, like this, this guy doesn't get it. He thinks this is about like he thinks the American empire is a poorly run security business that's like not making enough profits. And, he, you know, he's demanding from South Korea, I want cost plus 50 percent. The cost of the American troops housed there plus 50 percent. And by halfway through his administration, that became his thing. He wants anyone, anyone, wherever there are American troops, you got to pay the entire cost of those deployments plus give us 50%, right? So from the point of view of um, people who think that the American informal empire is good and vital and essential for the reproduction of 
fill in the blank, freedom, democracy, capitalism, you'd see this guy, you think this guy's really, really dangerous. And so I think that's ultimately sort of what's at the root of Trump derangement syndrome. But Trump derangement syndrome infected the left because I think the left doesn't really have any autonomy from the Democratic Party and it doesn't really have any autonomy from the mainstream media. When push comes to shove, as it did during the lockdowns, the left did a 180 and they turned their back on everything that the left has stood for. I mean, free speech and censorship, right? I mean, who made that a possibility, right? Uh, listeners might not know this, right? But the First Amendment isn't nationalized until I think it's like 32 for a long 1932. For a long time, the First Amendment was seen as applying only on federal territory and the states could make their own laws around speech. The way that the First Amendment was nationalized was through a series of political struggles, often bloody, that then involved court cases. And almost all of these were done by leftists, by anarchists, communists, socialists, trade unionists, right? So the, the American left is what delivered us free speech. And now the left has turned us back on free speech. I mean, it's astounding. It is astounding and deeply troubling for, for me personally. I, I, I am, I'm shocked by this. The left pioneered the whole critique of agency capture, right? how corporate influence affects science and regulation. It just all of that went out the window. People who could get into tremendous detail about how the, the very same pharmaceutical companies, you know, with their, or maybe not pharmaceutical companies, but you know, very, very same type of companies that, that, you know, push pesticides and GMO seeds, how exactly they have captured the regulatory agencies and that the revolving door, all that then just are completely gullible when it comes to these, we now know, ineffective, relatively ineffective uh, at stopping transmission, somewhat effective in terms of uh, suppressing symptoms, uh, definitely had some positive effects in terms of uh, preventing people from dying of symptoms with, if they had comorbidities and were older, but like but they're not like vaccines in the old fashioned sense of like you get one shot, you don't get sick and you don't transmit it, right? People just completely, people who could go on for days about agency capture in other realms then don't want to entertain, can't see how the same thing is happening around pharmaceuticals and the COVID jazz, right? So it's, uh, I, I mean, I think it's, I don't know why it's happened, but what I, what I have seen is that what has been revealed, this was the ultimate stress test for the U.S. left, and there was nothing there. An authoritarian state, corporate profiteering, an assault on civil liberties, which our political ancestors literally fought and died for to get for us. And all of that in an instant is abandoned. It's shocking. Yeah, it, it really is shocking. I, I think one of the things that could have happened, we've often said, at least on this show, we've said that Bernie Sanders may have led the left off a cliff because it was like two election cycles in a row. Bernie Sanders tells you, first time, vote for Hillary Clinton. Second time, go ahead and vote for Joe Biden. Joe Biden is also dangerous, right? I feel like Trump is over. Joe Biden is covert. I feel like Joe Biden... Uh, behind the scenes, his foreign policy is also pretty, you know, horrendous. Like he was just in Canada meeting with Trudeau, asking him to intervene in Haiti. Like, I feel like the U.S. government has their hands and all the, over the globe. I mean, the proxy war in Ukraine, right? I mean, let's, I mean, this is highly dangerous. I mean, the, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest atomic power plant in Europe is right on the front lines. That alone should be reason for this war to be stopped no matter what, right? When Chernobyl melted down, it was contained by a gigantic functional authoritarian communist state that had the power and the capacity, the administrative power, the political legitimacy, the means to order 260 or 70,000 liquidators to fly flights over that burning atomic power plant and cover it up with cement and then this build the esophagus over it. If the Zaporizhia plant goes, and let's be clear, it's lost power and gone to generator, diesel backup power generators, I believe it's six times. 
this year during the conflict, right? If that, if it loses power and then and starts to overheat and melt down, there's, I, I don't see any way there could be a response, uh, anything like the one that, that put out Chernobyl basically, right? So, I mean, this is an extremely, extremely dangerous situation. I'm not actually that worried about atomic exchanges between US and Russia, but I think that the, the Zaporizhia plant is the real problem in Ukraine. And, and yeah, let's be clear. I mean, Biden is really into this war. I, mm -hmm. And I think Trump is right that this war would not, we would not have this proxy war had, had Trump been president. I mean, Trump didn't start a new war. Okay, he bombed Syria twice. He drone striked uh, the head of the Revolutionary Guard in um, Iran. You know, he did a couple of things, but I mean, he, you know, he, he did not start any new wars. And um, that's pretty unusual for an American president. So do you believe that you, do you believe that that's the reason or more so that this indictment is more uh, politically motivated because they don't want uh, Donald Trump to win again? And there's a possibility that he could win again. Certainly, yes. I, I think, I mean, I think, I don't know, but, you know, one gets the impression that Alvin Bragg's ego plays a big role in this. And I mean, and then there's probably just an assumption that like, okay, this is going to hurt him. You know, I mean, it's, this is not good publicity to have this guy be arrested, whatever, but they may be wrong. They've been wrong about a lot of stuff. So I think, you know, I think they're they yeah they don't they don't want him to be reelected and that's what this is about. Look at all the other people who could be arrested, right? I mean, no one from the Bush administration has been arrested for creating a torture program, for selling us a bill bill of goods, lying about the weapons of mass destruction, and causing this totally devastating war that is a that is remade in horrible ways an entire region. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's political for sure. Now, I'm I'm not saying just to be clear that I think Donald Trump is a good guy, that Donald Trump is innocent of everything they're accusing him of. No, but yeah, certainly I think it's political. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Uh, what do you think, like in reference to the economy? Because Joe Biden, I feel like every time he has a press conference, he's telling people that the, the economy is doing great. Of course, we know this is not really the case, but he says they've created all these new jobs but they never tell you what those jobs are. They don't say if they're full-time, if they're permanent, if these are temp positions, contract, et cetera, if those jobs offer uh, benefits, full-time benefits. They're not really giving a lot of details and uh, specifics. Yeah. If Joe Biden, so far, he has not announced he's uh, definitely running for re-election. I think they're supposed to do that this month. If he does not run for re-election. I can't imagine that. I think he will, but whatever, go on, sorry. If he, if he does not run for re-election, who do you think should run? And do you think they should run through the Democratic Party? Oh, man. I think you should run. That's what I think. <laughs> I think, I mean, if you're into it. I, I, I don't know. I'm not. I, I. It's such a disaster. Pete Buttigieg. I mean, all these people. Oh, man. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm very, I'm very demoralized and dis, disillusioned with electoral politics. And I. And I, I'm not thinking about it that much. I supported Bernie Sanders and I was very disappointed about how that went. And, and, and the fact that he didn't extract more from Joe Biden, you know, that he, he just, and, and the same with Hillary Clinton, that he, that he succumbed to the terror of the Republicans and, and just handed over his votes and all his power to them. So I don't know who should run, you know, and I, in a way, I think it doesn't matter that much. Um, and of course, it does matter, but there's a way in which it doesn't matter that much. You know, you look at the, the presidency of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was actually a pretty progressive president in terms of some of his policy achievements. He wasn't a progressive person and he wasn't a progressive president. He was a, he was a you know, he was a conservative, anti-Semitic, bigoted, right wing Republican. But he was under a lot of pressure from the left globally and domestically. And as a result, he provided over the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, over the Mine and Health, uh, Mine Safety Administration, uh, the creation of OSHA. He experimented with a universal basic income. He signed mm -hmm. a ban on uh, biological weapons. I mean, you know, it goes on and on, right? Um, he and 
you know, he took steps towards ending, began to wind down the Vietnam War. I mean, that's that's sort of he could have done that sooner. And he bombed the smithereens out of North Vietnam and while prolonging those negotiations. So well, I wouldn't put that in that category of uh, his accomplishments. But the point being that, you know, I mean, Richard Nixon did some really progressive things, not yep. because he was progressive, but because there were movements that were like, you've got to do something about this, you know, just to take the environmental stuff. Right. I mean, part of what creating the EPA was about, which cost a lot of money for American industry to clean up their act. They did not want to do that. It was expensive. It cut into their bottom line. Part of why he did that was because there was enormous pressure about how filthy the environment was. You know, I was raised in New England. I'm, I remember all the streams were filthy. They were disgusting. Now they're clean. You know, why is that? Bald eagles, when I was a kid, bald eagles were something that you read about in first grade because they were in Alaska, right? Now there are bald eagles all up and down the Connecticut River in New England feeding off of fish that have returned. Why, why is that? That's because of the laws that the EPA was created to enforce. The Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, you know, all those laws that Republicans rail against, you know, they're not exaggerating. Some of these Republicans, like the incredible imposition of these laws, it's like they're, they're really powerful laws. They're great laws, you know. Unfortunately, they're just not enforced vigorously enough. But so, so Nixon enable all that to happen, not because he was a good guy, not because he was progressive, but because he was getting pressure from environmentalists, but also he was getting pressure on all fronts. And he could try and derail the class rebellion. I mean, there's massive wildcat strikes by labor in the late 60s and early 70s. General Electric in New England, we're both in New England right now. You're in Boston. I'm out in Western Mass. You know, General Electric had a massive nationwide strike that um, – that they won. And it, it was determined afterwards, GE did a study and they realized, well, these strikers not only getting their strike pay, but because of like the war on poverty and the kind of liberalization of things, they were receiving welfare, you know, general assistance benefits. And, um, you know, the progressive reforms of the New Deal and the war on poverty were really empowering the working class. And there was tremendous labor radicalism and agitation and even the, the union leadership were frequently saying to workers do not go on strike you can't do this is illegal and they go on strike anyway you know yeah. uh informed by you know the the civil rights movement black power movement uh vietnam veterans against the war i mean this is all in the background and these workers are coming to these jobs at the post office or this or that and they're like you know what no I mean, people are talking about revolution i, I don't care you know you you, you you guys sitting around in the union office smoking cigars you know no, we're going on strike, right? So Nixon was also responding to all that. And it's like, well, let's just change the subject. Let's turn, channel it all into environmentalism, right? So anyway, I'm going on and on and on. But the point is that <clears throat> even a very conservative, reactionary politician like Richard Nixon was forced to do very progressive things because social movements were strong enough and they were also sophisticated enough to be strong, you know? They weren't just like, throwing themselves, you know, willy nilly at, at the system, but they had, um, they were creating unity and they were making class demands that were very frightening for the elites. And to keep a lot, the elites had to give a little, you know? So that's what we need more, more than the right person to run for president. We need the context that's going to force whoever is president to feel that they have no choice but to do some of the right things. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. I've been covering the protest in France and because I want people in the U.S. to see what's possible. Uh, mainstream media, when they cover it, they either in, in some way smear the protesters like how dare they protest because the retirement age is going to be increased. Uh, but I've been covering it heavily here. And I just want American people to see, look, they have over a million people out in the street in France. This has been going on for days. And they have different unions that have come together. The railroad workers have come together. Even the fire, the firefighters have decided to join in. Like, this is huge. Like, in France, they don't put up with this. 
Yeah. Like, but we, I feel like we are a lot more propagandized in this country. And, and honestly, I think people are distracted. There's more people that care about the Kardashians and Netflix and chill than they care about fighting for like a class issue in this country. Yep. Yep. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. The French, the French working class, good stuff. And others, I mean, they also have different laws. Um, you know, I, like we've got this, uh, it's so hard to form unions here, but I, I don't know the exact details, but my understanding is that you don't really need many people to sign union cards in a French workplace before you get the union. Like I think that like a minority of workers can unionize uh, a workplace. So the late Bob Fitch was explaining all this to me right before he died, but he, and he was, he had worked in the labor movement and he was saying, until we get laws like France, it's hopeless. You know, it's like, uh, it's not all. It's not all about the culture. Though there's something different about the French. It's, 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 it's also the, the legal context empowers left institutions in a way that in this society, the legal context disempowers us. But yeah, it is heartening to look at the French. I remember when I was in graduate school in London, there was a lot of protests. I forget what even what they were about, but yeah, it was just it was it was kind of eye opening as an American, even even someone coming from the left, but. I think it was they were going to cut subsidies to the farmers in France. So they brought all their lambs to like the government palace and started cutting the throats of these lambs and throwing them on the steps. You know, it's like, and the British were totally horrified. And as an American, it's like, whoa, that's horrible. It's like, you know, the French, like, well, what do you think they do with the lambs anyway? You know, and the, 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 the British were importing fish for the first time. And the French truckers would like stop their trucks and just open the trucks, hijack their trucks, open the trucks, dump all the fish out onto the highway, be like, we don't want this British fish. And it was like accepted. It's like, if you did that in the U S people would probably get shot by the police, you know? So there is, mm -hmm. there's that, that cultural, you know, culture of state repression and gunplay in this country that makes, makes things a little different. All right, Christian, I have two more questions for you. Uh, one, how do you feel about a general strike? Uh, we actually did a general strike summit about a year ago, uh, on RBN and we were trying to advocate for the need, the need why we need to have one. I look at, at you know, supply and demand. I also look at transportation. And I, I would say to have an effective general strike in this country, we would have to get the truckers on board, the railroad workers and the port workers out on the West Coast. Because I feel like if you shut down transportation, then that will affect supplies, right? So, if we had that unity among the truckers, and I feel like the Canadian truckers were on the right track with this uh, when they had the protest. If you have the truckers, the railroad workers, and the port workers, I feel like that's your general strike. And you do so with the list of demands. And I feel like some of these demands that we had like for progressive policies, if we were to implement that as a part of a general strike, maybe we could put pressure on those politicians in DC to pass some of these progressive policies. Like I'm only seeing them pass on the state level, like Massachusetts, some of these things have already passed. Yeah, I mean, that that makes sense what you're saying, but it, it seems like there's a larger problem of building the class consciousness of, of regular people in this country to, to be okay with something like that. Because you could imagine if those unions, if, if the transportation sector went on a general strike that just shut down the economy and other workers in other sectors of the economy weren't intellectually, politically on board for that and prepared and in solidarity, it could backfire, right? So it's like mm. the, the strategy of what you're saying makes perfect sense, but it just seems to me like there's the, the deeper problem is building class consciousness, building unity. And I mean, the good news is we've got programs like yours and others that are doing that. So, um, but I feel like we've got a long road to go. And I, I mean, that get back, get, gets back to the COVID 180. And so there's got to be some recovery from that. I, I think the left has to deal with the fact that it made serious mistakes in supporting the lockdowns and being so uncritical of all of the pandemic responses. And then, you know, I think there's also, um, well, there's so much, you know, there's so many problems. I don't know. I'm not a great, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a scholar of social movements. I'm not, 
a, uh, a strategist, a great strategist. I, my, my activism such as it has been is, you know, less than really minimal these days, but it's always been as a foot soldier. I don't know. I don't know what's the right thing to do, but I do, but I do really think that class consciousness and getting people to get out of their parochial little interests, um, and, and, and giving up on the cathartic dopamine hits and, and sadistic highs of canceling each other and fighting over this or that mis misphrasing of whatever, you know, I mean that, that this whole kind of current subculture of the left is going to have to change if something like what you're describing is, is ever to be possible. What that's advice? Would you mass oh, movement. That's all. Yeah. Mass movements. Yeah. What advice would you give to someone who's thinking about becoming an investigative journalist? Um, talk to people. Do not be afraid of picking up the phone and talking to people. You can't do it all by reading documents. You, you need people to explain to you what, how to read the document, which documents to go for, uh, and to tell you things that aren't in the documents. You know, so and I guess that would be the one piece of advice. Because I think that younger journalists sometimes get, you know, get too caught in the, the screen and uh, the text and that, you know, you need to just pick up the phone, reach out to people, go see things, do ground truthing, as we used to call it when I was a reporter in Iraq, like go and see, well, they, oh, they claim they rebuilt this or that. Well, let's drive down there, you know, and look at it. So they said they spent $2 million here on this power plant or this water system. And this, let's go check it out. You know, what does the road look like? Oh, the firm is connected floor, unknown Texas construction firm, from t you know, gets a contract with the Bush administration to rebuild one of the main highways in Iraq. Let's go look at the, I mean, in, in Afghanistan, let's go look at the highway. You know, is it falling apart after three months or isn't that? So that's another thing, right? Going and seeing, get outside and talk to people. I agree. I agree. All right. Well, Christian, thank you so much for coming on. All right. Thank you very much for having me on and good luck with everything. Thanks. Bye. Bye.